It's Saturday, November 14th. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And yesterday, Friday the 13th, a Russian AN-124 Antonov cargo aircraft suffered a rare catastrophic uncontained engine failure, what appears to be a fan disc failure of the number two engine, crippling the aircraft and forcing the crew to make a quick emergency return to runway 25, the runway they just departed on, at Novosibirsk, if I'm saying that correctly, Russia. The resulting emergency landing resulted in a runway overrun of about 600 feet. Here's what we know so far thanks to Simon Radecki at the Aviation Herald. An Antonov AN-124 registered Romeo Alpha 82042 performing a freight flight, Victor India 4066, from Novosibirsk, if I'm saying that correctly, Russia, to Vienna, Austria, with 14 people and 84 tons of cargo auto parts on board. They departed Novosibirsk runway 25 at about 1208 local, that's 0508 Zulu time, Z time. Z is the equivalent to Greenwich Mean Time in aviation. We primarily use Greenwich Mean Time just to keep track of the time all around the world. And was in the initial climb through about 1800 feet MSL, mean sea level. Quick side note, in Russia, altimetry is a little bit different. They use QFE altimeter settings such that when you are sitting on the end of the runway ready to take off, your altimeter reads zero. The actual field elevation at Novosibirsk, I believe, is a little over 300 feet above sea level. They were in the initial climb through about 800 feet MSL when the transponder signal as well as radio communication was lost. The crew returned the aircraft for a landing on runway 25 but overran the end by about 200 meters or 650 feet. There were no injuries. The aircraft sustained substantial damage to the wings and the landing gear. Engine number two, the left hand inboard engine, remember four engine aircraft, they number them from left to right looking toward, as they come towards you, that'd be one, two, three, and four. Number two is missing its engine inlet following an uncontained failure according to photographic evidence. And we'll take a real close look at this here inside in a second. The inboard left wing slats as well as the left hand fuselage were penetrated by debris at multiple locations near the wing root. And as we look at the photographic evidence, it appears to me that this shrapnel went completely through the fuselage with some large exit holes out the right side of the fuselage. This is the kind of rare uncontained engine failure that can result in damaging even the other adjacent engines, even completely on the other side of the aircraft. But it appears that so far they only took out engine number two in this case. Ground witnesses reported engines three and four, both right hand, the right hand engines, were trailing smoke on departure. Communication with the aircraft was lost. The, man the aircraft managed to return to the airport and went off the runway and come to a stop with a collapsed landing gear. It appears to me that if the gear collapsed, it would have collapsed after they departed the end of the runway. Now here's something to consider international pilots. When you are operating in other jurisdictions, remember you are often considered guilty until proven innocent. West Siberia's, transportation, West Siberia's Transport Prosecution Office has opened an investigation into the accident. In a videotaped interview, the captain of the flight reported that the number two inboard left engine blew up at about 1,000 feet above the ground, 300 meters above the ground, just after gear retraction with the flaps still extended for takeoff. Debris damaged the aircraft's cabling, and I think in the translation they mean electrical wiring, not control cabling. Debris damaged the aircraft's cabling and took out all electrical supply, resulting in the loss of all electrical systems, including instruments, brakes, and thrust reversers. The aircraft remained controllable despite all electricity gone and all communication, even intercom having failed. So what a handful of an emergency. You can't even communicate with your crew to coordinate the emergency return. The crew attempted to establish visual contact with the tower, however, without success, and proceeded to land on runway 25 with very little margin due to low altitude and engine thrust. 
Remember in the old days before radios, you could get a clearance with a tower using light signals. When you got a green light from the tower, you were cleared to land. It sounds like that's what they were attempting to do. After a smooth touchdown, the overrun was unavoidable, unavoidable due to the loss of brakes, spoilers, and thrust reversers. And we'll talk more about that inside. So let's go inside and take a look at all this evidence. The interesting thing about accidents and incidents in Russia is everybody in Russia has a cell phone. They love to use them. And there's lots of surveillance cameras available in Russia. And it seems to me that this information gets out onto the internet and Twitter and YouTube right away. So we got lots of stuff to look at. Let's go inside and check it out. Okay, welcome back inside. Let's go to Google Maps and find out where this location is. Novosibirsk is located right about here. Let's zoom in and take a look at the runways. Turn the satellite on. Here's runway 25 and runway 07. So they were departing on runway 25 this direction. I think they made a left-hand pattern back around to land on runway 25. One thing to consider when you're using these runways and you shell out an engine, as they say in the vernacular, and fought out, you can potentially fought out the runway that you departed from. So part of your emergency return briefing and strategy has to consider, do we want to return and land on the very runway that we potentially fought it out with the debris from our engine? There is a second runway. By the way, both of these runways are about 11,800 feet long and the airport elevation, a little over 300 feet above sea level. There's a second north-south runway right over here. But looking at the METAR at the time, the winds were favoring runway 25. And in this particular case, the engine problem didn't occur until about 1,000 feet above the ground. So these guys were well clear of the runway and did not have the concern about landing on a previously fought out runway. Okay, first video we'll look at includes the takeoff. This video also has the interview with the captain on it. Looks like a normal takeoff. The a if the AN one two four looks a lot like a C five, well, it does. <laughs> You're right. They it's a very similar design, and somewhere about the point where he begins to retract the landing gear is where he has the engine problem. Just going out of screen there. Now I don't know if this is the left crosswind or the left base pattern entry. I believe this is the left base pattern entry, low and slow. We'll, get, we'll come back and take a look at that damage. Here's another look at that left base entry. So this is a great example of an, a quick emergency return. If you went through all the checklists that these guys were facing at this time, they would be up there for 20, 30 minutes trying to get that all sorted out. When you got to do an emergency return like this, stand by one. When you got to do a quick emergency return like this, if you went through all the checklists that this crew, the emergencies that this crew was facing, you'd be up there for 20 or 30 minutes getting through all the different checklists. There comes a time when you got to exert the captain's emergency authority and just dump the checklists and get the thing back on the ground. And you can very quickly do this if you simply shut down the engine from memory, go through your memory items, shut down that engine, turn the auto throttles off, retard the affected throttle, shut the fuel cutoff switch to that throttle, and pull the handle, rotate it if you need to, and then go right to your before landing checklist and make sure your gear and flaps are down and come back and land and on a visual approach. By the way, had the weather been IMC for this crew, that would have greatly complicated the nature of this emergency. So real quick, you can get these aircraft turned around and back on the ground. Remember too, all aircraft are engineered to be able to stagger around the pattern. If it's a twin engine aircraft and you lose one engine, all aircraft are designed at that weight to be able to get back around the pattern and come back and land. In the case of a four engine aircraft, you can easily do it with one engine missing and with 
a bit of a struggle, you could do it with two engines failed at that gross weight. Now let's take a look at some shaky cell phone video of the actual landing. He's getting lined up with the runway. He had a little bit of an overshoot, and he's got to correct back to the right. Again, visual approach to runway 25. He's got the gear down, and he's got the flaps down. And he's coming in pretty hot, and he needs to be hot because he's so heavyweight. He's not dumping any fuel. He's just coming back around and landing. He doesn't have time to dump, mess around with dumping fuel. He's too low to dump fuel. Now, in this situation, you've got your takeoff speeds, V1, rotate, and V2. If you take your V2 takeoff speed and add the appropriate additives for your landing configuration for your emergency, you can quickly figure a landing reference speed. How much airspeed indication these guys had, with given the electrical failure nature of this emergency, remains to be seen. There's talk that they were using the AOA angle of attack gauge. Now let's look at another clip that shows the rollout of this aircraft. It just goes and goes and goes. Why? Because look, there's no spoilers. Spoilers are critical to spoiling the lift on the wing and getting the weight on the wheels so you can apply the brakes. Also, there it goes off the runway, and if, if the gear collapsed, that's when the gear collapsed. Kind of like running into a concrete overrun barrier uh, off of off of a freeway that slows you right down another point the an 124 much designed much like the c5 and the c141 aircraft that i used to fly these are high wing or shoulder wing transport aircraft with high lift wings without the spoilers those wings are still producing a tremendous amount of lift so he's getting very little weight on the wheels to apply what limited brakes he has so the aircraft is basically just skipping down the runway another thing about these aircraft is you need to continue to fly the wings level all the way down the runway much like a glider or a light aircraft especially with no spoilers to keep those wings perfectly level level to avoid scraping an engine on the tarmac and these crews did a great job of that and another point about about the brakes usually you have at least four ways to get these aircraft stopped I'm not sure of the systems on the AN124, but normally you have normal brakes, alternate brakes, emergency brakes, and a um, accumulator brake system. So this crew probably had some form of brakes. It may have very well just been accumulator pressure. And when you're down to accumulator pressure, you lose all of your anti-skid capability. So it's very easy to blow tires when you're doing a maximum brake landing on just accumulator pressure without anti-skid braking. Now let's go back and look at some of this other photographic evidence. And here's what I'm talking about, a fan disc failure. This is not merely just a fan blade failure, it's the entire disc, and this is an incredibly rare event. This is not something that a bird strike is going to cause. A fan disc failure is a metallurgical failure, as you can see right here in the cracks. And these cracks have probably been propagating for a long time. When these fan discs fail, it's usually a metallurgical problem back when they built the disc or an inspection problem that they, an inspection that they failed to catch these cracks during an inspection and thus the disc eventually failing. And when these discs fail, they are a high energy impact, as you can see. Remember when we're talking about contained engine failure versus uncontained engine failure? We talked about this extensively in the uh, recent th Southwest incident. In the case of the Southwest incident, that was technically a contained engine failure, but the entire inlet structure to the cowling departed the aircraft, much like we see on this airplane. It was the damage caused by the cowling pieces that hit the window that caused the fatality on the southwest flight. However, that was technically a contained engine failure because when the fan blade cut loose in that case, and that was just a fan blade failure, it remained within the inside of the engine. This is a classic case of an uncontained engine failure, an uncontained fan disc failure, where the whole thing just blows right apart. Jet engines are designed to contain a, per FAA requirements, as we learned from the Southwest incident, 
they are designed on a test stand to fail one single blade and contain the damage that that causes using a Kevlar and aluminum containment ring around the compressor compressor and turbine section of the engines of the engine but it's just that one blade and the subsequent damage that it's that it's designed to contain when you lose an entire fan disc like this nothing's going to contain that amount of energy and that's going to penetrate outside of the engine casing and through the fuselage as we've seen in this aircraft very hazardous situation. Remember, this was the Al Haynes scenario in the, what was that, DC-10 that cut through all three hydraulic systems and resulted in the famous Sioux City crash landing and subsequent change of design of that aircraft. So here, looking at the left side of the AN-124, you can see the entire inlet section of the cowling has departed the aircraft and you can see the shrapnel damage of the fan disc segments and blades penetrating the left side of the fuselage and the leading edge slat now it's hard to tell whether the gear is uh, collapsed or just buried into the mud it's probably quite heavily damaged and that's a great thing about these cargo style aircraft they do have a very robust landing gear uh, and cargo bay section and they belly land quite gracefully and the engines remain clear now this photo here look at this you can see the exit wounds out the right side of the aircraft where they're darn lucky that this shrapnel didn't begin to take out engines number three and four and now, looking at engine number two, I don't see the, the fan section at all. Where's the fan section? Right in here is the fan blades. I don't see them at all. What it appears to me, that looks to be just the stator veins, the stationary veins from deep inside the engine. Where's all the rest of it? This thing really shelled out completely. There's a close review of the stator veins in here. Again, where's the fan section? Where's all the, the fan section that should be going right in here? And, of course, the, the cowling separated as well. By the way, the cowling forward of the engine is not designed to, is not the casing that's designed to, to um, capture this shrapnel. The casing is back in here. Approximate final position, some uh, 650 feet or so off the end of the runway. So with this fan disc failure, investigators are going to need to look at the serial number of, this, of these components, when they were manufactured, and when they were last inspected. Go back, review all those records, and then go look at subsequent parts that were manufactured and or inspected right next to this part and see if there's a problem with the fleet or a problem with this, this series of fan discs potentially grounding the entire fleet of aircraft or the entire fleet of aircraft that has these engine parts on them. So I hope that gives you a better understanding of what happened to the Russian AN-124 aircraft yesterday, Friday the 13th. Thanks so much for your support of this channel and especially thanks to all the folks on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.